It is wonderful to be with you all here tonight to study God's Word together. Turn to Luke chapter 5. I'm sorry, Luke chapter 12. <clears throat> Luke chapter 12. I'll start reading in verse 35. Let your waist be girded and your lamps burning, and you yourselves be like men who wait for their master when he will return from the wedding, that when he comes and knocks, they may open to him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. Assuredly, I say to you that he will gird himself and have them sit down to eat and will come and serve them. And if he should come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, Blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect. In this passage, and in many other passages, Jesus promises us that he will return and that there will be a judgment for everyone. And because judgment is coming, he tells us in verse 40 to be ready. Well, in order to be ready for judgment, there are several other things that we as Christians must be ready to do. And tonight we'll look at just a few of those from the Scriptures. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. <clears throat> 2 Timothy chapter 4. Firstly, we must be ready to preach the Word. 2 Timothy 4, starting in verse 1. I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at His appearing in His kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and teaching. Paul is very straightforward here. Preach the word. And he doesn't say, preach the word whenever you feel like it, whenever it's convenient. Preach the word when people want to hear it. Preach the word to whoever you think will listen to you. Now Paul says, be ready to preach the word in season and out of season. When it's opportune and when it's inopportune. And Paul himself is an excellent example of doing just that. There were times when it was pretty simple for Paul to preach the gospel. Turn to Acts 17. Acts chapter 17 beginning in verse 16. Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Therefore he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshippers, and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him, and some said, What does this babbler want to say? Others said, He seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods, because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak, for you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore we want to know what these things mean. For all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you, God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings, so that they should seek the Lord, in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. 
truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, while others said, We will hear you again on this matter. So Paul departed from among them. However, some men joined him and believed, among them Dionysius the Areopagite, a woman named Damaris, and others with him. So here in Acts chapter 17, when Paul was at Athens, it was definitely opportune for him to preach the word. He saw that the city was given over to idols. He realized the people there were very religious, like he mentioned to them. And then they brought him to the Areopagus and asked him to preach, essentially. They asked him to explain the gospel. And Paul was ready. He took that chance. He preached a sermon right there. He told them about God. He told them about Jesus. Paul was ready to preach the word. And when the opportunity arose, he took it. And because of his readiness, lost souls were saved. Now for Paul, there were also times when preaching the gospel was inopportune rather than opportune. Turn just a few pages over to Acts chapter 20. <clears throat> In Acts 20, Paul is at Miletus and he has called together the elders from Ephesus and he's explaining his situation to them. So Acts 20, starting in verse 17. <clears throat> From Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, You know, from the first day that I came to Asia, in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews, how I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you, and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying to Jews <clears throat> and also to Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And see, now I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. So Paul is on his way to Jerusalem, and he knows that when he gets there, he will suffer. The Holy Spirit has told him multiple times that chains and tribulations await him. But Paul doesn't mind, because when it comes down to it, Paul values preaching the gospel above preserving his own life. And so, we have Paul as an excellent example of the right attitude to have towards preaching the Word. He preached the Word when it was convenient, and he preached it even when he knew he would endure suffering as a result. He preached the Word to people who wanted to hear it, and he preached it to people whom he expected to beat him and put him in chains because he preached to them. In Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Paul says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Do you have that same confidence? That is the confidence, that is the boldness that God commands us to have, to be ready at all times to preach His word to everyone. So we have to be ready to preach the Word. Secondly, we must be ready to explain why we have a hope of eternal life. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15 says this, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear. What if a random stranger walked up to you and asked, Why do you believe in God? Why do you have faith in Jesus? Why do you believe that you will live in pure bliss and joy for eternity? If someone walked up and asked you those things, would you be able to answer them? That's what this verse is about. 
to be ready to give a defense for the hope that is within us does not mean that we must possess extensive knowledge about all of the archaeological and historical evidence that points to the validity of the Bible. It doesn't mean we have to know every detail of how the Bible came to be what it is now and when and where all the scriptures were written and how it was translated and all of that. And all of that evidence for Christianity is incredibly helpful and it is powerful but it's certainly not absolutely necessary to our faith. I think the key to being ready to give a defense for the hope that is within us lies not within the physical evidence for Christianity but rather immersing ourselves in God's Word in striving to follow His paths and thus growing to have a closer relationship with Him. It's no accident that 1 Peter 3.15 begins with the words, Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. To sanctify is to set apart, to make holy. And God is the Lord of our life. He should occupy a special and holy place in our hearts. Our primary goal should be growing closer to Him. He should be our main focus. Are you diligently studying that you can have a a better and more thorough knowledge and understanding of His Word so that you can more closely imitate Him? Are you praying to Him without ceasing as 1 Thessalonians 5.17 commands us? And if you're doing these things, then whenever someone walks up to you and asks, where does your hope come from? Then you can tell them confidently with meekness and fear as the verse says, let me tell you where my hope comes from. Let me tell you about the God I serve. And let me tell you what wondrous things He's done for me. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So we are commanded to be ready to preach the Word and we are commanded to be ready to give a defense, a reason for our hope. Thirdly, we must be ready to do good works. Titus chapter 3, verse 1. Titus chapter 3 and verse 1. Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work. God has a lot to say about good works in Scripture. And I'm just going to read several passages here to give us a better sense of how important good works are to God, how crucial they are to our Christian walk. Um, there are several in Titus, in, cha- in Titus chapter 2, starting in verse 6. Likewise, exhort the young men to be sober-minded, in all things showing yourself to be a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that one who is an opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say of you. And just a few verses down in verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. And then, of course, there's verse 1, which we just read, to be ready for every good work. A few more verses down in verse 8. This is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. And then in verse 14, And let our people also learn to maintain good works, to meet urgent needs, that they may not be unfruitful. And then there's 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Related to that is Matthew 5.16, when Jesus says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. 
Finally, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17 through 19. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. So we see from these scriptures that doing good works is very important to God, it's v and it's very beneficial in many ways. Doing good works helps us maintain a good example, a good reputation, so that others can't speak evil of us. Doing good works is a way in which we can be zealous for God, one of many ways to serve Him and please Him. Maintaining good works is profitable, helps us to be fruitful servants in God's kingdom. Doing good works can cause others to glorify God, and by doing good works, we lay up for ourselves an actual solid, a spiritual foundation so that we may gain eternal life. There is another passage that mentions good works that really stands out to me, and that's Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, which reads, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That's about as straightforward as it gets. We are created for good works. Doing good works is one of our main purposes for even existing. It's why God created us. And it says that He prepared them beforehand that we should walk in them. And God never commands us to do anything they were not able to do. God has not commanded us to do good works and then said, well, good luck, you're on your own. God has made sure that we are able to be ready for every good work. And I'll mention three things that God has given us to help us toward that goal. First of all, God has given us each other. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. You have the ability to stir up other Christians to love and to good works. Just think about that. With your words and your actions, you actually have, you are able to so strongly encourage others that they will become more loving and more kind, more abundant in good works towards others. And that's a powerful ability that God has given us. Let us not ignore one another. Let us not forget one another. But let us consider and exhort one another in order to stir up love and good works. So God's given us each other to help us towards um, accomplishing more good works. And secondly, God has given us His Word. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. That is a powerful thought. I can't wrap my mind around that. That here on pieces of paper in front of us, in a physical book, we have wisdom from the mind of the creator of the universe. I can't wrap my mind around that. It's, it's incredible. God has given us scripture as a powerful tool. Use it, read it, immerse yourself in it, in the wisdom of God, and you will be ready for every good work. And finally, God has given us the perfect example of good works, and that is His Son, Jesus Christ. Now this is a fascinating thought about Jesus. James chapter 4 verse 17 says, To him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. And we know from many passages, such as 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 22, that Jesus committed no sin. Thus, when I say Jesus was perfect and sinless, I'm not just saying that Jesus never committed a sinful act. I'm saying that Jesus did good works at every single opportunity he had. That's incredible. And we can read about Jesus. We can look at his example and how he lived. And that will help us to be ready for every good work. 
and take every opportunity we have. So, we are commanded to be ready to preach the word. We are commanded to be ready to give a reason for the hope within us. And to be ready for every good work. As I mentioned at the beginning of the lesson, being ready to do these things is just all part of being ready for judgment. Luke chapter 12, verses, verse 40, which I read at the beginning. Jesus says, Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. We don't know when Jesus will return and when we will all be judged. But we don't need to know when. We only need to know, we only need to follow what God has commanded us so that we will be ready when that day comes. And in His Word, God has given us clear commandments on what we must do to be saved at judgment, to inherit eternal life. We must believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and confess that belief. We must examine the Scripture and identify the sin in our lives and turn away from it, cast it away. And we must finally be baptized in water, symbolic of the blood of Jesus, so that our sins are truly washed clean. If you have not done these things, it is never too late. It is never too late. As the book of James says, draw near to God and He will draw near to you. If you need to do that, if you need to be baptized, if you need, or if you simply need to confess something that's been weighing on you, or if you just need to ask for encouragement, every one of us here is here to help you and you can come to the front. Let's stand and sing. Good morning.